Okay, so uh, the lecture today is on language and uh, other cognitive functions, uh, but I'm not going to talk about many other cognitive functions because the chapter that you've been uh, reading is uh, very much only on language, so I, I'm going to stick relatively much to that. Um, so the whole question of uh, language localization in, in the brain relates to a very large extent to a debate which has been going on for uh, quite a long time, basically from the very beginning of uh, neuroscience, you could say, which is really uh, whether the brain works as a whole or whether there are specific parts of the brain which has specific functions. And uh, to a large extent, that debate started out with uh, Franz Joseph Gohl and uh, the so-called phrenology, uh, which was a discipline which was uh, quite popular in the beginning of the uh, 1800s. Uh, the general idea of phrenology was that uh, specific parts of the brain would have a specific function and that that part of the brain would then be larger or smaller in uh, people who had more of that or less of that ability. Uh, so you would uh, have different parts of the brain being responsible for uh, different faculties. One of them definitely being language, but others being uh, animal instinct uh, or uh, higher abstract thinking, uh, the ability to uh, do mathematics, uh, the ability to uh, understand Latin, etc., etc. Uh, so uh, what Franz Joseph Gall did was to divide the brain into sort of all of these areas where he believed that uh, different functions were located. Uh, none of it really being uh, very scientific because his idea was that uh, if you were very good at doing a specific thing, then that part of the brain would sort of become larger and that would sort of make a change in your skull. Uh, so therefore, by measuring uh, very carefully uh, the dimensions of the skull uh, in different areas, he was sort of using that to uh, get ideas of these different brain functions. So he was sort of going the other way around that uh, he sort of had his idea of what people were good at. So he would take one who was very good at Latin, say, and uh, then see how that skull would be different from other skulls. And therefore, if that was in one particular area, then that would be that area which was involved in the Latin. Uh, so if, if you look at the ideas he had, uh, it was uh, sort of filled with uh, some, what, prejudice uh, so he would uh, take skulls from uh, people from different parts of the world, like people coming from Africa compared to uh, uh, white people from Europe, and uh, based on the idea that uh, Africans obviously uh, have much more animal instinct than uh, Europeans, who are, on the other hand are much better at doing abstract thinking, uh, then he would measure and see which parts of the skull was different in black people from Africa as compared to white people and thereby implying what parts of the brain were different in uh, people from the different parts of the world. Uh, very obviously, uh, this was not something which was uh, easily accepted by uh, most people uh, doing uh, real research, I would say, but it was enormously popular in uh, the general public uh, and there was quite a lot of work being done in measuring skulls and uh, it was also uh, part of uh, the uh, things that you would do in a pre-television uh, evening society in uh, uh, one of the bourgeoisie homes in uh, Paris, you would uh, measure each other's skulls and uh, see if you could make it fit with whatever things you were good at. Partly because of that, uh, Pierre-Marie Florent uh, was asked uh, in the beginning of the 1830s uh, to investigate this idea and actually 
see if uh, there was something to it. His approach was to uh, cut away parts of the brain, uh, not in human subjects, but in mainly pigeons and rabbits, and uh, seeing what effect that would have uh, on mainly the uh, behavior of the animal. Uh, so he would cut away whatever part and then see if that had an effect. And in general, what he found was that, especially in pigeons, when cutting away small parts of the brain wherever it was, it had hardly any effect. Uh, maybe some effect to begin with, uh, but not all that much. If you just waited a week, uh, the pigeon would be doing quite okay. Uh, so his idea was very quickly that there was no specific area of the brain which was involved in one particular function, but that the whole brain was working as a whole. So the more you took away, the more uh, symptoms the pigeon would get. Uh, so basically you need some kind of uh, network uh, which has to work together and the more you take away the, the more uh, severe the deficiency becomes. So that was sort of the debate between phrenology and then the brain being responsible for uh, as a whole for, for the various functions that we have. So it wasn't really until uh, Paul Broca sometime in the 1860s uh, described a patient who had uh, um, uh, hemorrhage of uh, part of the frontal area uh, where the language area is now being located or the Broca area uh, and what he found was that this patient was unable to uh, produce language but without any other major uh, functional deficits. So it was very specific, it was just language which was lost. And relatively soon after that, uh, Wernicke described a similar deficit or a kind of a similar language deficit in a, uh, a patient with a lesion in the parietal temporal uh, region uh, where the sensory language function is now known to be uh, located. And that was relatively quickly followed up by uh, work by Fritz Hitzig, David Ferrier, uh, showing that uh, stimulation of specific areas of the brain would evoke uh, activation of specific muscles, uh, and uh, also uh, Hermann Monk uh, demonstrating uh, that stimulation of uh, the um, occipital lobe would produce uh, visual images. Uh, so that led into the whole idea that, uh, that we're now uh, uh, realizing that, that there is this uh, functional differentiation in different parts of the brain uh, and that there is some kind of a, a functional uh, location uh, taking place.